Today, synths are everywhere in music. But do you know the story of how they were invented and why? It's a story that brings us back to 1913 Italy, to one of the first groundbreaking avant-garde movements, to a problematic visionary trying to solve the crisis of tonality, Luigi Russolo, the inventor of a new type of instrument, the Intona Rumori, the godfathers of synths. Hello, top patterns and newcomers! This is Simon Mas, a guy who's facing a challenge. Can I take you on a journey into the big bang of electronic music, show you how a century-old invention sparked the day synth revolution, give you lots of details and a twist at the end in under 15 minutes? Well, just watch and see. If we want to grasp the whole scope of Russell's ideas, I need to give you some background. It will take less than two minutes and you'll have a story to impress your mates down the pub. Ready? Go! 1910s. Western music is broken. Tonality was facing a terminal crisis. Composers had stretched the limits of what was possible for decades. Ambiguous chords, improbable harmonies, unresolved cadences, all fine and dandy, but now tonality, the very basis of our music, sounded like boring old news. Time to get a move on, to give music some new blood. Yeah, I'm simplifying a lot, but you try to sum these up in under two minutes. The francophone world looked for musical ideas from faraway cultures, both in space and time. Tambo, exotic scales, Modal harmonies. Focus on rhythm. The Germans instead hammered out a brand new universe based on the 12 tone row. A brainy way to give equal importance to each of the 12 notes of our system. Back in Italy, someone wasn't impressed. Futurists were a group of intellectuals and artists who were all about the new man, one that had been surrounded and bettered by technology, progress, machines, industrialization. If music was to go forward, it had to embrace the speed, energy and noise of the new cities. Down with the French with their vague de passion. Enough with these term and wrong Germans. It was time for a new idea. Enter Luigi Russolo. Luigi had studied violin in a conservatoire when he was a kid. He then decided to become a painter. In his teens, he worked on a restoration of Leonardo's The Last Supper. Oops. Sorry, that's the right one. In 1909, poet Tommaso Marinetti published the Futurist Manifesto. Age 24, Russolo had immediately joined the movement. In March 1913, he attended a concert of futuristic music in Rome. The music composed by Francesco Balilla Pratella wasn't much to write home about, honestly. But Russolo did write a letter to Balilla Pratella to praise his efforts and to introduce the concept that could make futuristic music much more worthwhile. That letter later became known as L'Arte dei Rumori, a seminal manifesto. Russolo had several clear insights about the problems modern composers were facing. The main issue he maintained was that music had always been made of pure sounds. After centuries, this had naturally led to boredom. Every sound carries with it a bundle of sensations that are already known and worn out, predisposing the listener to boredom. We futurists have all deeply loved and enjoyed the harmonies of the great masters. Now we are sated with them, 
and we enjoy much more combining the noises of trams, internal combustion engines, carriages, and crowd shouting than hearing again, for example, the Eroica or the Passerol. <laughs> Boom, baby! Rather than finding new ways of arranging all notes, Russolo wanted to add new sounds to a composer's palette. After all, according to physics, unpleasant noises and nice sounds differ only for two related details. Noises are generated by irregular vibrations and they have no discernible pitch. Now, if one was to tune up the essence of each noise, if one could extract a minimum of regularity from them… Well, that's new. Russolo was up to the challenge. Time to turn his words into action. Russell had already indicated six fundamental families of noises in his L'Arte dei Rumori. Now, he needed a way to reproduce these noises at will, somehow pitching them in the process. He needed a new class of instruments. The Intona Rumori or Noise Singers. From the outside, these were simple wooden boxes with a cardboard cone serving as an amplifier. Some had a crank that could be turned to start the mechanism inside, others had buttons to that same effect. Once the mechanism inside the box was going, each could generate one specific noise sound, usually, but not always, by rubbing, hammering, pitching or otherwise sounding a piece of string with a wheel. The wheel could be of different materials and of different shapes, thickness and sizes thus mimicking different sounds. The string was then attached to a drum that served as a resonating body, a bit like what happens with banjos, but with one string hitting the drum head vertically rather than being arranged horizontally over it. Then, as a further refinement, each internal rumori had a lever coming out on top of the box. By moving the lever, the operator could change the tension of the string, getting different pitches for the noise sound, creating scales, or gliding freely between note and note. Through the years, Russolo and his collaborator Ugo Piatti managed to create 27 varieties of intonal rumori. Each was named after the type of noise it could reproduce. Howlers, thunderers, cracklers, hissers, gurglers, and so on. You have heard some of them in between the sections of this video. But the very first of all, the Exploder, debuted less than three months after Russolo wrote his initial letter to Balilla Pratella. On the 2nd of June 1913, at a futurist performance in Modena's Teatro Storchi. How did it go? Unfortunately, there's no surviving recording of that first performance. The historical accounts are clear on one thing, though. It was a riot. Literally. Journalists, university students, petite bourgeois, bel canto lovers, they all arrived armed with preconceived ideas for or against futurism. And just like we saw in the case of the Parade Ballet, video linked in the description, people long to settle scores. Screams of to the mental hospitals or reactionary asses, loud laughing, applauses, cheers, all obscure the demonstration of the Intona Rumori. Like them or not, the Intona Rumori, even at that extremely primitive stage, opened a new way. For the first time, one could synthetically reproduce a sound and then pitch it to play music with it. Isn't that what modern synths are all about at their core? After that first tragic comic performance, there were more serious attempts to have real instruments and intona rumori playing together. In 1914 alone, Russolo had soirees in Milan, Genoa and London, 
the 12 Knights at the London Coliseum were met with a growing sense that this man was onto something. And then the war put an end to any planned in Tonorumori demonstration throughout Europe. A bit like your indifference can put an end to my efforts. The best way to make me stop creating more and better free videos for you is simple. Don't engage with videos in any way. Don't leave any constructive comment to tell me how I'm doing. Don't care for the community we're building together. Don't tell your friends about this project or video. Don't subscribe to my Telegram channel to stay in touch and to get free music suggestions every now and then. And most of all, don't consider making a small donation to yours truly to help pay the bills. If you want me to stop, that's the way forward. But if you ever wanted help, now you know what to do. Thank you. Despite the war, Russolo kept working on his ideas. His Risveglio di Nacita, Awakening of the City, was probably the best piece featuring in Tonarumori for a long while. And when he finally published L'Arte dei Rumori in 1916, the book included a host of other writings with another historic innovation. A new system of musical notation for the Intona Rumori, one that is still in use for some electronic music to this day. Throughout the 1920s, there were more concerts. The Intona Rumori were often used during futurist pantomimes or as background accompaniment to theatre pieces, but then World War II came and all the existing Intona Rumori were destroyed by bombs or fires. After the war, Russell stopped caring about music and went back to painting. It was the end of an era. From music concrete to industrial music, from John Cage to Trobin Gristle, the list of musicians and composers that have something to thank Luigi Russo for is really long. And if you think of Intona Rumori as the first rudimentary step in music synthesis, that thank you list becomes almost endless. It is true that the applications of Russell's ideas were very limited at the time, mostly because only a handful of frankly not too talented futurist composers decided to include noises in their compositions, and most of them used in Tonarumori as novelty items. But Russell showed the world that it was possible to build machines that could reproduce sounds and pitch them in a way that could Ban what was naturally possible. And that's at the heart of the sonic possibilities that synths give us today. During the 2010s, many in Tona Rumori were rebuilt from the original notes, and several museums and concert halls around the world organized events and commissioned new compositions to celebrate Russolo, his L'arte dei Rumori, and the legacy of the Intona Rumori. Now, everyone else would close the video on this high note. They'd leave you with Luigi Russolo, one of the spotless heroes of 20th century music avant-garde. But I can't do that without betraying this channel's mission or without leaving my claim that Russolo was a problematic figure unexplained. I need to tell you the whole story. You see, Russolo, like many futurists, was a full-fledged fascist. For various ideological reasons, he loved Mussolini and the fascist regime, and there is no indication that Russolo ever had a change of heart like other futurists did. Does that invalidate or taint his work, his ideas, his legacy? As far as I'm concerned, yes, it does a fair bit. You know that I hate fascists with a passion, but I've just made this video about a fascist. See, I do not believe in cancel culture. I can celebrate the good of Russell's work and the joy it gave me directly or indirectly while still laughing at his dumb political ideas. To do otherwise would be disingenuous and problematic. And, excuse me if I'm frank, a bit fascist too. Well, my dear top this was your Simon Mas. I might have 
failed my 15 minute challenge only just in the standard video and almost certainly in the extended version that you will find on my Patreon when I'll open one. But no matter, you can't tell this story wasn't worth telling. Anyhow, stick around for more music related tales and look for the many sources I've used to write the script of this video that I have linked in the description in case you want to learn more about this subject. For the moment, stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye!